Located at the top of Wisconsin, Bayfield County is considered by many of the locals to be the wild side of the dairy state. This is a place of majestic beauty with national treasures that include the Apostle Islands, the natural wonders of its sea caves, and rugged sandstone cliffs that frame the clear waters of Lake Superior. This is Bayfield County Wild. Hello everyone, I'm Nancy Christopher. And I'm Mary Motif, Director of Bayfield County Tourism. Thank you for joining us for Bayfield County Wild. The Apostle Islands has some of the best sailing in the world. It has reliable winds, it has great spots to anchor and enjoy the wilderness. Mary, tell us some of the things people can see sailing around the Apostle Islands. Boy, what you see is gorgeous, beautiful wilderness. Um, A portion of the islands are an actual designated wilderness area, the Gaylord Nelson Wilderness Area. You know, the islands have now been untouched for um, decades. There were people living out on the islands before they became a national park. So you'll see some interesting relics from when people were living out there. But when you're just sailing around the islands, all you see is, you know, the beautiful forest and these gorgeous brownstone cliffs. And that's the, the really striking thing that sets this area apart from a lot of others. There are 22 islands in the, in the National Lakeshore. And so each one of them is different, but they, they all have similar qualities. You bring up the name Apostle Islands. There's some pretty interesting history behind how it got its name. It's more a mistake than... Uh, than historical. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) They thought there were 12 islands when they were first encountered. And and so, of course, there were 12 apostles. Right. So they they named them the apostles. And in in reality, there are 22. So, you know, (laughs) it's not a really accurate name, but it, it stuck. It's a cool story, though. And I understand there's a connection between the Apostle Islands and Chicago. There is. The reason there's that connection is um, the famous Chicago fire that happened oh, know, right. over 100 years ago. Isn't it the, the cow who kicked over the lantern and started yes. the big fire? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> and so in order to prevent that from happening again, uh, they thought they would start building some of their major buildings out of a material that wouldn't burn in a fire. And so the brownstone that is up here that make up these beautiful cliffs, they decided that they would take that to build these buildings with. And so you see these gorgeous brownstone buildings all over Chicago and then also Milwaukee and New York. I think the idea caught on and that was all quarried up here in the Apostle Islands area. And so they made this trek from, it was quite a feat to get you know, the stone quarried from the islands. I can imagine. Back, back in the day, um, all the way down to Chicago to build those buildings. You can really appreciate that now when you see those. Oh, yeah. And the brownstone buildings are so pretty. And then I, I just read an article recently where there's an old mansion that has been recently restored in the suburbs of Chicago that, again, was built with this brownstone because, you know, it was just so gorgeous. Yeah. And of course, we have to mention the sea caves. That's one of the really great features of the Apostle Islands. Right. And the, so there's sea caves that have been washed, you know, the waves wash up against the cliffs and um, over years and years and years have created caves. So there are sea caves along the mainland part of the National Lakeshore as well as out on the islands. And so when you get out and about sailing around the islands, or however you can get out there, whether it's kayaking or sailing or... Uh, or walking in the winter. Oh, right, along the mainland shore, for <laughs> right. sure. With the ice. Yeah, they just make those beautiful formations in the wintertime. One of the other things that you'll find on the Apostle Islands are lots of lighthouses. Are you able to climb up to the top of all of these lighthouses? Not all of them, but some of them, for sure. And there are guided tours, actually, of some of them. So the Raspberry Island Lighthouse, for example, there is someone staffed there in the summertime that is dressed like a lighthouse keeper that will take you on a tour of the quarters and tell the stories of the people who lived there. And you do indeed get to climb up to the top of the lighthouse and you have to be a little brave because you're climbing on these little ladders going up the tower. Right. And, but it's worth it for the view. It is just awesome um, being up on the top of that lighthouse and looking out over 
uh, the rest of the islands. It's it's incredible. So Raspberry Island and then Michigan Island. And, and actually, Michigan Island has kind of a neat thing. They had a little train track set up to bring goods up from the ships that would come in and dock. And they had a system to bring it up the side of the hill and then sh- ship it around um, up on top amongst all the buildings up there. And that's all there um, and has been restored. And there's always something different on each island. If you Google sailing around the Apostle Islands. There is a blog that is written by a sailor uh, and his wife, and it is an incredible document of his travels. I think they were there for like two weeks, and he describes the area, and it's so beautiful. And I really would encourage people who are thinking of doing something like this to to Google that and, and hear the story because it's really a great testimony to the Apostle Islands. Well, it is. And it, it actually gives you a really realistic view, too, because their first experience sailing in the Apostles was not great. They had bad weather and it just wasn't enjoyable. And so they almost didn't ever want to come back again. And luckily they did. And they did tell the story really, really well. And so, yeah, I, I would recommend reading that, too. Yeah, it's excellent. So if you're like me and you don't have a sailboat and you really don't know anything about sailing and it is a skill, how can you experience sailing? Of course, we have lots of ways to do that. So there are small sailboat charters with, you know, one or two sailboats and you can sign up to go out on a trip with them and they'll take you out for a lovely adventure. And you can do like either a morning sail or an afternoon sail, or you can do a sunset sail, or you can do a multi-day sail. And so you have uh, the captain takes you out. You can either do a private sail with them with however many are in your group. I think they can take up to six people usually on a sailboat. Or you can, you know, if you have a larger group, you could do two sailboats or you can just have, you know, one or two of you and you can just sign up and go with another small group on a, on a trip. So you can keep it pretty affordable and still have this incredible experience sailing. Another way to go out sailing, there's a, a company called Superior Charters where you can actually skipper your own sailboat if, if you know how to sail or hire one of their captains to take out and they have 30 or 35 different choices of, wow. of, of boats you can take. You can also do a learn to sail vacation. Or if you kind of know how to sail, you can do an advanced sailing class to learn, you know, even more skills. Then they do team building excursions and executive retreats. So this is like a great way for a company to take their staff out and do a really incredible team building exercise. So you can do group trips, multi-day trips, multi-boat flotillas. So they're really equipped to be able to take you and whoever else you'd like to go out with for any kind of sailing adventure that you want. So then one other type of trip that you can take is with an organization called Lake Superior Tall Ships. Oh, wow. These are those boats that you picture when you think of pirates, yeah. you know, with, with the giant mass. So this is an organization that normally their goal is to take youth out to really get them unplugged and engaged in this incredible experience of sailing. And literally from the time you get on the deck, whether you're with one a youth group, you know, that's doing that sort of a thing or these sales are open to the public too. And they get everybody involved. No sailing experience is required. But from the moment you get on deck, you're invited to help raise the sails, take a turn at the wheel, or you can just sit back and relax. Wow, that sounds like a lot of fun. Are there power boats on Lake Superior? Um, yes, there are lots of power boats on the lake as well. And because there are so many islands to sail around or, or boat around, you don't just see a bunch of boats everywhere. You know, they're kind of tucked around different corners and bays. And it doesn't, I wouldn't say it gets crowded out there, but there are days, like, especially when they are having a regatta or something where you see just lots and lots of sailboats and all the other kind of boats that are out there, whether it's a a powerboat or kayaks. It's, It's a very popular place, definitely in the summertime. So how can we learn more about sailing up there and even book a, a charter or whatever? The easiest way actually is on the bayfield.org website. If you just go to their search bar and type in sailing, 
It's going to bring up all the businesses that have to do with sailing that are members of the Bayfield Chamber and Visitor Bureau. We have some additional information on our website as well at travelbayfieldcounty.com, and that would be under our business directory. However, our sailing is just under the activities and adventures category, and so you do have to sift through a little bit more. So it'll give you a more uh, succinct list if you go to the bayfield.org site. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mary. Of course. Our next segment is for land lovers, and in particular, golfers. We are talking to Tim Landgreen at Northern Pines Golf Course and Event Center in Iron River. So please stay with us. The forecastle is the place on a boat where the crew eats and sleeps. It's also an exceptional inn located on the south shore of Lake Superior, just minutes from the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. The rooms have their own private entrance from a second floor deck right on the water's edge in Siskiwit Bay. Breakfast is delivered to your room to enjoy privately. Browse the beachside gift shops and stroll the sandy beach at sunset. Everything in town is just a short walk away. Learn more at siskiwitbay.com. Welcome back. About 15 miles south of the south shore of Lake Superior is a place our guest calls a vacation paradise. Tim Landgreen is the owner of Northern Pines Golf Course and Event Center. Thanks for joining us, Tim. Yeah, thanks for having me. I understand the golf course was a family dream of yours. Tell us about Northern Pines. Well, there's a long history behind this. This property has been in my family for over 120 years now. We originally picked it up when it was just made available back in the old days, and it's been in the family ever since. My mother got it from her aunt. My aunt got it from her dad, I believe it was, and I bought it from my mother. And in 1993, I retired out of the military. I spent 20 years in the Army, and I came back here thinking I was going to do, you know, just the family thing. We're going to farm and just raise the kids and be there. And we worked for a while, and it worked out pretty good, but then I had to get a real job. And we thought about <laughs> that for a while, and, and we said, you know, we've got all this acreage. We need to do something with it. And so we were just talking about that, and I had played a little bit of golf when I was in the Army, and I, I really enjoyed the game. And I either my wife said something or I said something, they said, says we should do a golf course and we, we thought about that and looked at each other it was like an aha moment and we raised some money and we did just a tremendous amount of uh, sweat equity they call it where we do a lot of the work and all of a sudden you know, we started forming up this golf course and people were coming by and they were bugging me all the time when are you going to open when are you going to get going I was like I'm working just as hard as I can just give me a break <laughs> Because, you know, we just start putting irrigation and wiring and everything else in the ground and trying to grow grass. Then I had never been a groundskeeper. Never. I had no idea what I was doing. But I had a lot of friends that were subject matter experts. And so I used to pick their brains. And we talked a lot. And they told me a lot of things that I thought I needed to know. And they told me an awful lot of things that I didn't need to know. <laughs> From there on, we built it. And we've been here almost 20 years now. Next year will be our 20th year. And we've been doing pretty good. We're holding our own. Yeah, congratulations. So how many acres did you have, and how long did it take to actually build the course? Well, we started a test thing down by my house. There was a, a field down there, and we started out with a driving range. We did that for about a year, and that was back in 1998. The people were just packed in there. I mean, we probably had 15, 20 people at a time. You know, it's a very small area, just practicing hitting balls. And the same old story, you know, when are you going to open a golf course? Because we had started doing a couple little things, and the driving range did really well. And so we said, okay, it looks like we got the right interest in the right area. We're far enough away from another golf course that was in the area, so it didn't feel like I was imposing on them. That's when we started building it. It was probably 1998, and we opened in 2001. We've got a big pole barn down there, and we just took a small corner of that, made a little... Uh, clubhouse I guess for lack of a better word of it and we just sold rounds of golf and we had golf carts and everything we had brand new golf carts and then uh, we built a small pavilion where we used to have our uh, cookouts in and from there on we, we were there till about 2005 and we said okay I think we've got this established we know what we're doing and in 2005 we have a, a hill on the property uh, it actually is more of a ridge and it overlooks the valley and so we looked at that and we said you know that'd be an outstanding place to put a clubhouse so we wanted it right Rustic, so we built a 40 by 80 clubhouse, all rustic, hot food siding on the outside, and then popple uh, trim on the inside. And then from there, it just took off. After, what, 2011, my youngest daughter came up, and she said, well, we're getting married. And I said, oh, yeah, great. You know, we sort of figured that out. <laughs> she says, where's the reception going to be at? Well, we're not quite sure yet. We're going to invite 400 guests. <laughs> I looked at her, and I said, 400? Where do uh, we put them? Where are we going to put 400? Because I used to 
do 200 in the clubhouse we had. And I look at, back at that today, I'm going like, I don't know how in the world I ever did that. So anyway, I had this grand idea. We've been doing so many events and weddings and parties anyway. I said, well, let's just take off with that. You know, that way we'll have sort of a dual income source, you know, with the, with the golf course. So I added on another 40 by 60. And I started in May. She got married on August 11th. Oh. And two days before she got married, I pounded in the last board. Oh, and, my. Yeah, we, I was pretty busy there for a short time. No stress. A, oh, yeah, well, no. Nothing like a hard <laughs> deadline, right? Yeah. So what kind of acreage are we talking about there? Well, I have a total of about 300, and half of that is tied up in the golf course because... I sort of had a guy come in there and help me design it because I, I couldn't wrap my mind around, you know, how to design a golf course. And so we sat down, we talked, he sort of laid it out for me. And then I brought in the uh, Wisconsin DNR and she says, well, you know, you, you can't do this, you can't do that. And I'm going like, wow, you're, you're sort of limiting me on what I should do here. And he says, well, if we do this, we can do that. And if we do this over here, we can do that. It's sort of like a mitigation thing. And I <laughs> said, okay, fine. Now we're, now we're talking. And so I used up, oh, probably, I don't know, 150 acres out of the 300 but when we built it it is extra wide and you know it's average length it's right around 3200 yards long and it's par 36 and it's got some elevation changes which makes it really interesting and it's got some really good dog legs on it you get out in the back we call it link style because it's more of just open field whereas you get closer to the clubhouse it's got more tree lined so it gives it a lot of character i guess is a good word to put it how would you rate the golf course in terms of challenge uh, we tell everybody when they walk out the door, I says, or they walk in the door, we say, you know, if you, this is the first time being here, we recommend that you take a golf cart. You know, it's, it's a little bit long, not overly long, but this way you get a chance to really enjoy it. And then when you come back in, you know, if you want to go for a second round or if you want to come back another time, if you feel like you can walk that, then, then by all means, go ahead and enjoy the day and go for a walk. But the last hole, number nine is coming up the hill. So I think it's 60 to 80 foot elevation change from the bottom to the top and the green is up on top of the hill and we sort of thought about that not as a definite purpose but when you come up you get a little tired you're thirsty you want to sit down you know and have a have <laughs> relax in the clubhouse yeah that's smart thinking yeah. <laughs> you know lots of golf courses have their hole-in-one clubs and I understand your first hole-in-one golfer was a man named Larry Lynn back in 2003 but since then, he's had three more hole-in-ones. They didn't all happen at your place, did they? I believe they did. You know, I, oh. Larry has golfed out here a ton. He he has been here since day one. He was one of those guys knocking on the door, you know, saying, hurry up, build it, let's get going. And he has been a, a huge supporter of what we do here for all those years, for 19 years. He slowed down just a little bit, but he still hits the ball very well. And we use him as our instructor here, is that if anybody needs some lessons, you know, we recommend that you go talk to Larry because, you know, he's taught both my girls i've got two sons they didn't get into golf as much as the girls did uh both girls went to state because they they just were very good and larry's been been just like i say a huge supporter and he, he hits the ball well and that's why he gets all the holes in one but of course you know if you hit the ball at the hole a bunch of times sooner or later you're going to get a hole in one if you just keep hitting it <laughs> yeah i guess it's the law of averages but you know some people go their entire lives and never get a hole in ones he must be good he's got a little luck going too. lucky larry yeah, yeah. I, and and i think that's his lucky course <laughs> So as an event center, what kinds of events are held there? We've really taken off since the, we added on the, we call it the large room, the big room. We held 16 weddings last year. I, th I think we're well up over over 200, 250. It's hard to keep track over the years. We usually average between 8 and 10, but last year was, for some reason, was just an extremely busy one for us. And then on top of that, we normally hold about three major golf events every year. Really, they're fundraisers. Uh, we do the Huber, which is a, a huge fundraiser for the local uh, sports kids in the area. You know, baseball, hockey, all that stuff like that. Okay. A, lot of, a lot of money goes back into that. And then we do two cancer awareness golf events where they take and they raise money and a lot of that money is st it just stays local you know if you've got a friend or you know somebody that has cancer or needs help you know getting back and forth gas money whatever they take that money and they they funnel it towards them because and it helps it stays local and really does a good job i have a very core group of golfers a golfer is probably within ashland superior hayward i guess is my circle you know all the way to the north shore they've been coming here for years but you know after 19 no oh, well, i say almost 20 years we still get people to come in here and go like, we never knew this place was here. And I look at them, I just smile and go like, darn it, 
we're very well known, you know, in the wedding area because I feel we do a great job. And everybody, when they leave here, you know, I just want to make sure that when they get married here, that it's the most special day as it should be. And I do everything to make sure that that happens. But on top of that, we've done a couple of funerals here. And I take special pride in that too, because the, the big windows on the end of the building are set up in shape of a cross. And so that's kind of special for them. And birthdays and graduations and just, uh, we're doing an anniversary party for, well, I think they've been married, shoot, I think it's 75, 80 years. Oh it was this huge. Oh my gosh, huge. that's a long time. Wow. I noticed on my way in, Tim, that um, you have a really pretty gazebo outside um, that you can see from the event center, and that must be where the ceremony takes place when people are actually getting married on site. That's another story. I got a story for everything around here. And <laughs> we had so many weddings that we were doing, and they were all over the golf course, and they, they'd want to go down by the pond, or they would have a special tea box or someplace down by the oak tree. And I said, you know, we're Getting away from the clubhouse, we, I got to transport all those people back and, and, and just was turned into a mess. So one night I was sitting up there and on the computer and I was Googling arches and this picture of a pergola popped up and I looked at that and I'm going like, it was just like an aha moment. And I took and I said, this is what we're going to do. And so we brought in some fill, flattened out the area on the backside of the clubhouse and got that all straightened out and irrigated it. And we plant rose bushes and we've got fencing around it and sidewalk that comes from both corners of the building and goes out there where, you know, you're, when you walk out there, you sort of meet in the middle and join hands and you walk up there into that uh, pergola. And we do outside seating with that. We've got white chair covers, the whole ball of wax for that thing. Sounds beautiful. It's just, yeah. It really should. is. And it is, you're right, it is a pergola, not a gazebo. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so with all those events, how many people do you employ over the summer? We're a family-based organization. I've got all my family, you know, that's within driving distance works here. And plus probably five people that are part-time employees. You know, I've got one guy just does fairway and one guy does uh, the roughs, mows. My daughter's mother-in-law works up here now. I just got to the point, actually, all the, after all these years, I'm going like, you know, I'm getting I'm getting older and I'm starting to slow down just a little bit. My son is a huge help. He takes and he does a lot of the stuff. I'm trying to teach him a little bit more of what I do because it took me 19 years to figure out a lot of this stuff. I hate not to pass that on. Well, one of your biggest events held at Northern Pines is the sled dog race in February. Tell us a little bit about that, too. That was something that I had no idea. It was way out of my comfort zone and way out of my box of, of knowledge. I know nothing about sled dog race. I know, I know something now after February. But the chamber approached me and said, would you mind, you know, being the host facility for that? We had to chew on that a little bit because it's in the wintertime. And so, you know, I've got to heat my facility. Then I've got to get the water running because it's mostly my big plan was to not be open. Open. In the wintertime, I thought I was going to take the winter off. But anyway, we've, we've been doing winter events for a while. And the sled dog race requires a trail. And so part of the deal, I said, look, you know, the first year, I'm just going to take and donate just about everything that I had going on. Because I said, this is going to be something for the community. And I, it's going to be something that we're all going to benefit from. So what happened is I teamed up with Rob Lombard, the Fire and River here. He's an ex-musher. And, and uh, some other individuals. I, I, there's a bunch of them. So I'm not going to name them all. So we started working on a trail got that mapped out and then we had to trim the trail and then we had to groom the trail and that was just in the fall and there was like four different lengths to this and we went down the uh, corridor luckily we were able to use that and then we went jaunted off a few different places we ended up going 16 miles total distance eight miles there and eight miles back and but when it worked out you know we finally got to that day it was february 16th and we had the best turnout the people from the area came out you know it was of course it was a beautiful day and the mushrooms showed up in force. We're doing it February 15th, next February. I think okay. it's 2020. So we had to, we we're limiting it to the 50 teams. We've already got everything set. We've got the purse up there and we've got some of the best pictures that I'm going to tell you about the website that you can go in there and look at all this stuff. Air Fox, I believe it was, had their drone out here and he took some just super pictures. Like I say, it was just a beautiful day and the trail was in great condition. We had a lot of help from the from the county helping to get the trail straightened out. So the chamber did a survey close to 600 people showed up just to watch it and with the 30 teams the parking lots were full we had the atv club up here move, shuttling people back and forth and everybody thought that was just great and it was a lot of organization the chamber did a great job on their end you know raising money helping us support everything that we were doing because once again that this is way out of my zone of what i know what to do well it was an awesome event i was up here for that just to watch and having the clubhouse 
as a spot where people can come in and warm up and get some food. You guys had the best biscuits and sausage gravy I think I've ever had that day. <laughs> you know, so just having this really awesome spot and the view looking out and you can watch where the mushers, well, at least when they're on the shorter courses that you can see, it was just ideal. It was awesome. And and what is the purse for the dog race? Well, we, last year it was a total of $4,000. You expecting the same this year? or? I think we're, we've projected that in our budget. We're going to go there, but there's other costs involved in that also. So we're always looking for sponsors. So if somebody's out there that wants to sponsor a really great sled dog race in Iron River, just contact Jerry at the chamber and she'll help you set up that money for using that there because we really do a lot for the community with that you know bringing a lot of people a lot of people stay here uh, they eat here just the whole nine yards it's a great venue for people with their kids you know to get out and enjoy the day the mushrooms in general were saying also this this is probably the best sled dog race that they have been to because of the clubhouse there's someplace warm to go inside they that's have always warm important ba- yeah they have warm <laughs> bathrooms you know they're they're really impressed with that yes nice amenities yeah and there were there were lots of activities going on too i think you had oh, someone yeah. here with uh, snowshoes so people could try out snowshoes and and those all those events were free too we had angie over here doing face painting and she was selling her cookies from the bakery and the vfw well they had some stuff out about their thing over there they're trying to build oh the park the yes. veterans park yep. and they did the national anthem to, yep. to kick off the event yeah it was great so you mentioned tim that there's a website with great pictures where would people go for that actually i'm gonna tell you about three websites we have the one for the sled dog is northern pines sled dog race it's northern pines s d r R, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll think about that. And then we have the other two for it's Northern Pines Event Center and then Northern Pines Golf Course. Every one of those, you know, you can go in there. Like the sled dog one, I don't know if it's up and running yet because, like I say, we're like brand new and we're just getting this all together. I think the guys are looking for a domain to put that stuff on and there's that should be up shortly. But if you just go in there and, and Google that, I pictures are still in there somewhere. Okay. Well, and, uh, we'll be sure to put those in our show notes so that people know where to go. How many events do you think you have coming up this summer? Well, I know that we have eight to 10 weddings. I don't keep anything in my head anymore because it just turns into a jumbled mess. So I could write every, I write everything down. I've got a calendar and that's just for the weddings. And then I've got uh, two or three anniversary parties. And then there's some class reunions on top of that. Usually every weekend we have something going on, but don't worry about golfing. You know, if you want to golf, we can still get you in. That has never been a problem. We have plenty of space. And even though there's a wedding going on, I might go out there, you know, and just hold you up a little bit while they get married because that's special moment i sort of promised them that <laughs> but they uh but the golfing will just wait and the beer will still be cold and you'll have a great day at northern pines golf course that's very cool coming up next mary has an ever-growing list of things to do in june so don't go away benoit cheese house is an old-fashioned specialty cheese shop that carries many of wisconsin's finest cheeses since 1973 people have come in for great service and great cheese today the store has expanded to include many other items with wisconsin charm including locally produced maple syrups, honey, wine, ice cream, old world meats, soaps, jams, relishes, and much more. Benoit Cheese House takes pride in custom-made cheese and sausage trays and specialty gift boxes for any occasion. Come in to sample some of Wisconsin's award-winning cheeses and then stay for a while to explore the area. You can also call or order online to get your order shipped. Benoit Cheese is a great destination for all ages. Open Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. More at BenoitCheese.com. That's B-E-N-O-I-T-C-H-E-E-S-E.com. Welcome back to Bayfield County Wild. Mary, this is perhaps the busiest time of the year for Bayfield County. Give us some highlights. I'd be happy to. So June, we have Bayfield in Bloom still happening um, up in the Bayfield area. Lots of fun events going on for that. More details at bayfield.org. We have Eat, Drink, Washburn still in effect through June 7th. And that that's sounds where like fun. <laughs> it is, of course. You can spend $10 at three or more participating businesses and you have your passport stamped at each of them and you're entered into a drawing to win a $50 gift certificate to any of the establishments that are participating. Yeah, and that's perfect for visitors. Well, right. You get a reward of 
eating for doing your eating that you love to do. <laughs> right, right. That's one of the best parts of vacations. Right. Then the first weekend of June, we have the seventh annual Rumble on the Lake, which is a, a gathering of motorcycles. They do all sorts of fun things over the weekend, including just taking some beautiful rides around the area. But they also do a poker run on motorcycles, um, you know, heading to lots of different participating businesses and having fun that way. And that's, um, that's actually a fundraiser event. We have lots of those fundraiser events up here. Right, you do. And then June is dairy month. So there's a big celebration all month long at Benoit Cheese House. Benoit is in the center of the county. So it's easy to get to from anywhere you are. It's worth a trip because they have lots of uh, specialty cheeses that you can't find everywhere. And of course, that's what we're famous for. We're all cheese heads up here. Right. And then they also have some local ice cream from Tetzner's Dairy, um, including their little ice cream sandwiches. So definitely worth a stop. And then Kids Fishing Day is happening at the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center, which is a great way for kids to get out and experience for the first time, if they haven't been fishing, how to do that. There's a pond there um, that's stocked with fish, and there are experts there to um, get you out equipped and outfitted and take a stab at fishing. And it's a fun, fun day for kids, um, all sorts of other activities going on as well. And then of course, June really, uh, our farmer's markets are, are kicking into high gear with with having more things available at them. So Port Wing every Saturday, Washburn every Wednesday, there are a number of other farmer's markets that take place too throughout the area. There's the ninth annual Spider Lake Run, June 8th in Iron River. And that is a two mile walk run, a 5k or a 10k. And that is a beautiful location um, to get out and do that kind of a fun run. What isn't beautiful up there this time? I know, I know, it's true. Dandelion Days is happening in Washburn. And I think this is the second time they're doing this. And the first time was a huge hit. It celebrates community and brings awareness to our relationship with the natural world through education, ecology, art, music, and fun. And so there's just all sorts of different cool things happening at Dandelion Days from live music to vendors and all sorts of fun for the kids. So Dandelion Days and Washburn June 8th. And then the next weekend is the Washburn Citywide Garage Sale, which is just fun if you love to hit garage sales. Um, there's Very a ton cool. of, right, there's a ton of them happening all weekend that, that you'll see uh, on a map that they publish in the newspaper and they have it available, you know, around town. There's also a nature fest at the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center. So um, this is not the birding and nature fest that happened earlier at the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center, but just a nature fest, which is just a couple hours where they bring together some master naturalist volunteers that will have some hands-on activities and fun. Then there's the Superior Vistas Bike Tour, June 22nd, Notice that the name is tour, not race. So it's it's a way to get you out and enjoy a beautiful scenic bike ride. And, and there's different uh, distances that you can ride. And the, it's a supported ride. So there are stations as you ride around. I want to say the longest one is like 100 miles. But oh wow, <laughs> you don't have to ride 100 miles to enjoy it. Uh, you can do one of the shorter routes. And um, that starts... That would take me days. <laughs> it would take me days too, Nance. You and I can just do a... A lower key one sometime. But that starts at Thompson's West End Park right on the lake. Beautiful place to start. And then some of the vistas, because it's called Superior Vistas, are literally up in the hills and then looking out over the lake. It's just gorgeous. Then there's a fun event in Iron River called the Maker's Fair, June 22nd. And that's at White Winter Winery. And uh, it says, browse the wares and works of local artisans making specialty handcrafted items, anything from goat cheese to wood carving and everything in between. And then the last event on my list is uh, the Golf Against Cancer, which is one of those events Tim Landgreen just talked about a fundraiser event out at the Northern Pines Golf Course. You know, again, so much going on. This is only a taste of it. These right. are just the special events. There's tip all of the sorts iceberg. Of, tip of the iceberg. There's all sorts of ongoing events and activities that you can do all month long as well. And where do we get that information? The best place is travelbayfieldcounty.com. And not only do we have our event calendar on there, but we also have a really great interactive map that I really, really suggest taking a peek at if you're looking for all sorts of ideas of things to see and do in the area and as well as places to stay. And if you want the latest, you should also go to your Facebook page too, right? Yes. And actually, sometimes there will be things on our Facebook page that we don't even have on our event calendar just because of the way social media works and we can easily share things to our page there um, that people haven't submitted for our website. So what are we talking about next month? 
So next month, we're talking with Marvin Defoe from Red Cliff about the 41st annual powwow. And the really cool thing about this year, they have the Young Spirit Singers from Canada coming to be the host drum. And you'll learn more about what that means. But they were nominated to the 2019 Grammys and just took, yeah, they just took Best Contemporary Group at the Indigenous Awards earlier in May. So that'll be really an exciting um, event to talk about and learn more about. Yeah, I'm going to look forward to that because these powwows, that's a really big event there and it's so colorful and really interesting to watch. Absolutely. All right. So stay tuned for the powwow next month. And to everyone listening, if you like what you've heard today, we'd love to have your support. So please take a moment to share, review, or subscribe to Bayfield County Wild. If there's anything you'd like to know about today's episode, we'll have the links and resources available in our show notes. And on behalf of Mary and myself, thank you for listening to Bayfield County Wild. Bye-bye.